Father God, we give you praise tonight. And we thank you that your anointing is already here. Now God, breathe on your people tonight like never before. God, we give you praise that the oaks are going to be destroyed tonight. We give you praise because the that the power of God shall flow in Jesus' name. God, we give you praise that we ascend tonight together in the name of Jesus. We give you praise that blinded eyes are going to see. We give you praise that deaf ears are going to hear. We give you praise tonight, Lord God, that yokes are going to be destroyed. Chains are going to be broken in Jesus' name. We give you praise tonight that we leave here with a renewed mind. Right now in the name of Jesus, God, we give you praise tonight that through by way of your word, that you're going to dip our perception in the Holy Ghost. God, let us see it the way you see it in Jesus' name. We give you praise, Lord God, tonight for the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. I wish you would clap your hands tonight and give God praise. Come on, that's all right and that's for me. But I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one that woke you up this morning. Come on, open up your mouth and bless him. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, open up your mouth. We bless your name, O oh God. Your name is exalted, even amongst the heathen. And we bless you, God. We search this world over and over, and we still haven't found anybody like you, Jesus. You are a healer. You are a deliverer. My heart has been broken, but you healed me. I've been in some bondage, but you delivered me. And God, we give you praise tonight. We bless your name. 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 God, somebody needs to know that you are a healer tonight. And we bless your name. Somebody needs to know that you are a God of breakthrough. And we bless your name. Somebody needs to know that you are a miracle worker. And we bless your name, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And if you know you've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy, you ought to just lift those hands up tonight and bless his name. We bless you, God, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We bless you tonight. We come against tired bodies tonight in the name of Jesus. And we press tonight. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We give you what you deserve tonight, God. We give you what you deserve tonight, God. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And so, God, we bless your name tonight. Yes, Lord. We shift this atmosphere right now in the name of Jesus. Heaven has got to go. Depression got to go. Oppression got to go. Disappointment has got to go. Discontentment has got to go. And we release the power of the Holy Ghost. God, we thank you that you're going to arrest us tonight in the name of Jesus. And we lift our hands and turn ourselves in tonight. Do what you want to do on the inside of us. Break us if you got to break us. We give you praise, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. I'm going to teach and I'm going to get out of your way. But this preacher, didn't he preach on Sunday? Oh, y'all ain't, ain't saying it right. When I left here on Sunday, my mind was open to a, an aspect of God that I had not 
or that I thought I was delivered from. <laughs> I thought that God had already uh, swept that foundation and made sure that it was clean. But if we really tell the truth, all of us got some religion on the inside of us. And, and I ain't talking about a pure religion either. I'm talking about a religion that came from somebody that gave us. I, I, I feel like I'm in a bucket. Put something in this mic. But a, a religion that came from somebody who did not really have relationship. But they had a form of godliness. Let me tell you something. If we really be honest tonight. Uh, some folks would be offended um, by me saying this, but there were some things that we learned in church that 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 really wasn't uh, really wasn't God. If we really tell the truth, and so uh, I, I grew up in the Baptist church, and I'm not anti-Baptist. Uh, I love the Baptist church, uh, but there were some things about uh, what I how I grew up. And some things that I was taught that now at 33, I said, uh-uh, that, that, that wasn't right. And so uh, he said something on Sunday that really uh, hit my, my spirit and really uh, made me think. He said people were preaching and teaching their, their own personal convictions as doctrine. <laughs> and so because the Lord told you. Not to go to the movies. Now all of a sudden can't nobody go to the movies. I ain't got no help tonight. And so the reality is, is that is that we've sat under people who really didn't have the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now I hate to say it like that, but it's just the truth. And so what has happened, God bless you, Pastor Zach. I'm going to try to read the scripture tonight, but y'all just going to have to flow with me. Because I, I want to really piggyback off of this preacher from Sunday. But one of the things that he talked about, and it made me think about my upbringing and, and how I came up, is he talked about growing up in church. And I remember my grandmother on my father's side, uh, she was a, uh, a church mother. And she, she uh, was the leader uh, or would lead uh, what they call missionary meeting. And so all of the mothers of the church would come over on a set night and they would study the scriptures. And I remember growing up and grandmama, when we, we would go to grandmama's house on Christmas. And so after, after dinner, we would all be hanging out with the family and we want to go play spades. We was spades players. But at grandmama's house, you wasn't allowed to play no cards of any kind. And I, I, as a child, I'm trying to understand what's wrong with cards? That not only did she not play, but she could, you couldn't even play in her house. We had to sneak over Uncle Rick house or over Uncle Jerry house to play. I'm trying to understand, but, but she associated cards with casinos and gambling. And so now uh, it was wrong if, if you got caught even playing spades. Big, big whiz, gin rummy, none of it was allowed. I, I can't tell you how many dirty looks I seen her give women in church for having on pants. Just, I'm talking about just pants. I ain't talking about a, a skirt that, that was up today. I'm talking about just having on and don't let you be associated with her or her family because you were shown up in trouble after church. And so the reality was the reason why I'm bringing that up is because that had nothing to do with God or the things of God. We, we, taught, we were taught uh, what you have to look like on the outside, but, but never talked about the condition of your heart, that, that you were full of bitterness and unforget some of the meanest folks I encountered was church mothers. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me tonight. I, I'm talking about just mean as hell and, and would set you out. And I ain't talking about uh, with the love of God. See, we left out that part. We rebuked folk and, and cut folk, but, but didn't realize that Jesus was the ultimate love giver. And so we grew up in church and, and we had this 
For I had a preacher tell me one time, he said, uh, you don't cash your check at the liquor store. <laughs> he said, you don't want your good to be evil spoken of. Well, let, let me just say over the airwaves and the, all the church, if you see me in there now, I'm not cashing no check. But it's a strong chance I, I'm going to get Moscato. Cupcake kind to be exact. And so the reality is, is that uh, if you want to refute it, the scripture said that Jesus' very first miracle that he performed was he turned water into wine at the wedding feast. And some of them was already drunk before he turned the water into wine. So please don't bother me about when you see me at the liquor store. I'm not cashing no check. I, I got direct deposit. I'm going in there because I need something. And I'm serious. It's a heart attack too. Because we were taught some stuff that did not have anything to do with God. I remember the first time. Can I just take my time and talk tonight? I remember the first time I went to the casino. Pastor John. And, and, and I, I walked in. And I ain't afraid to say it because he don't care. I was with the man of God. And the man of God said to me, he said, do you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost? And, and I stood there for a second and I said, no, I don't feel no conviction. He said, I'm trying to teach you that what you've been taught didn't have anything to do with God. He said they made the casino a bad place. Yeah, it's bad if you don't have no self-control. But you ain't got to worry about me getting in trouble at no casino because I'm cheap anyway. So after about 20 is gone, I'm, I'm ready to go anyway. So you ain't got to worry about me. Now, now how, is it, how is it that temperance is a fruit of the spirit, but we don't have no self-control? Okay. So, so we were taught some things that were not necessarily right. And let me tell you why that's relevant. Because when Jesus, before he died and he, and he, and he was resurrected, he said, I leave you not comfortless. He said, but I leave you the Holy Ghost. But watch what he said. He said, he will teach you and lead you into all truth. Here's the problem. The Holy Ghost is trying to teach us on top of all the messed up stuff that we've learned. And the Holy Ghost is having a hard time getting through. Because what you're saying you're convicted by is not the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Turn this mic down just a little bit. But it is your moral conviction that's really got you convicted. It ain't got nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. See, when I stepped into the casino because of what I had been taught, uh, what I felt was in my morals, which is what I've been taught or, or who gave me. I was feeling in my moral conviction, I ain't supposed to be here. But the Holy Ghost didn't say one word. I ain't got no help tonight. And so what we are calling wrong, it may be wrong for you, but that don't mean it's wrong for me. See, it's, it's some places you might not be able to go. Uh, but please understand, uh, I got the Holy Ghost. He tell me, I don't go today, then I ain't going today. And that might just be Walmart. But, but see, we think because it's not necessarily bad, I can get away with it. But that don't mean you being led. And so what has happened to us is God is trying to fight through uh, or the Holy Ghost is trying to fight through everything that we've been taught incorrectly, trying to get us to understand the mercy and the grace of God. Well, even when you look at our salvation, we got salvation synonymous with living right. And I'm telling you that living right and salvation, those are two different... Those are two different things. The reality is, is that God understands. Now, some of y'all going to get mad at me tonight, and I'm just going to teach it the way I know how to teach it. But, but God understands that man has a sin nature. 
in sin did my mother conceive me, according to the scripture. We were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. So man has a sin nature. And the Bible says that we don't have a high priest that doesn't sympathize with our weakness, but he was tempted in all points just as we are, but was yet without sin. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying it took God 30 years to get Jesus' flesh tempered enough for three years of ministry. And it took him 33 years to get his flesh tempered enough for one hour in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I'm telling you, this flesh that we walk in, it ain't nothing to play with. The Bible says on the inside of your flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so there is nothing good for me uh, in my flesh. But the problem is, is that at the end of the day, I'm still wrapped in flesh. Now, is that a license? No, it is not a license, but he understands. Uh, the temptations that we experience, he experienced them too. The difference was, was that he was the son of God and he was way more spirit than he could ever be flesh. But the reality is, is that I'm still apprehending and I'm pressing toward the mark. So if you catch me on the wrong day, you might get flesh. That don't make it right. But it's reality. And so when you understand salvation, uh, the Bible says, according to Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8, we're going to go there real quick. I don't know where all I'm going tonight. Hand me my phone. I got some notes on there. I left my phone. Thank you. Is this making sense tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. It says this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says this, for by grace are ye saved. Somebody say grace. If you understand, now, now I'm going to tell you something. My understanding, based on my upbringing uh, uh, in church, uh, grace really was only talked about when it was in relation to covering sin. So when somebody was in sin, then we talked about grace and mercy. But the true understanding of what grace gives us the ability to do was really never explained. The reality is, if we really tell the truth, we are never a sin. The sin debt has already been paid. So, so sin, we ain't going to never really get away from sin. I'm not a slave to sin. Uh, but, but, but as far as on any given day, at any given time, I could miss the mark. Because that's really all it is. And so we're really not going to be able to get away from it. But what grace is there to do, if we really tell the truth, is grace is there uh, to still uh, give us communion with the Father, even though uh, uh, we might be in something we ain't got no business being in. God help us tonight. And so, and so if you look at the grace definition, he says it's God's intervention in the process of our justification, the permanent disposition to remain in communion with God. So what are you saying in layman's term, preacher? I'm saying that if I do get in trouble, God put grace there so that we don't have to be out of fellowship even though I'm in something I might not have no business being in. So, so have you been in trouble and God still came through for you? H have you been in some blatant sin? I'm talking about some stuff that you know you was doing that you didn't have no business doing, but God still showed up on your behalf anyway because grace was working, baby. So what he's saying is, is he's saying you don't have to leave my presence uh, because you in sin. You, you, you don't have to leave my presence because you did something you didn't have no business. This preacher said on Sunday, he said, we run from God when we know we ain't been doing right. But that's somebody who doesn't understand grace. Because grace says, I can come boldly to the throne of grace so that I may obtain mercy in the time of need. So when I'm in the greatest trouble, that's when I need to be running to him. 
Oh God, I got to tell you this. See, if you really want to understand grace, and the Lord told me this on my way to church, and now I understand what he's saying. He said, I'm going to release a healing anointing tonight. He said, but it's not going to be in the way that you think. He said, it's going to come by way of a thought process. And that's what he's really after, was after on Sunday, and he's continuing going after it tonight. And the reality is, is that when you understand grace, grace started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. You, you remember, you remember when Adam and Eve messed up, the Bible says that they were naked and ashamed. God took uh, uh, furs and made clothes and the scripture says that he clothed them so that they didn't have to leave his presence feeling ashamed. That's what grace allots us the ability to do is that we can be in trouble but don't have to leave his presence feeling ashamed because if you remove the grace element now we got condemnation and according to Romans 8 and 1 there is therefore no condemnation for them whose walk is upright who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit so the reality is is that grace exists so that we can stay in his presence so uh, y'all yeah, can can I just take my time tonight? And so, Adam and Eve was in trouble. They were in disobedience. But God said, I'm still a loving father. So I'm not going to leave you knowingly exposed and not do something to try to protect you. I'm so glad that he sent grace uh, for me. That when I was in some stuff I shouldn't have been in, he didn't leave me knowingly exposed. Uh, when, when, when we laid down with folk that we shouldn't have laid down with, who, who might have had STDs, but but we didn't get it. When, when we went in places where they were shooting guns and we didn't get shot when we was riding dirty. You know what it is to be riding dirty. It was the grace of God that covered us while we was riding dirty that the police didn't pull us over and take us to jail. I'm talking about the grace of God. Yes. We talk about the wrath of God, <laughs> but we don't talk about the grace of God. It is the grace. See, this preacher said on Sunday, he said, uh, fire and brimstone is not the good news. Now, if he'd have been in, in, in some of the churches that we grew up in, they'd have put him out if he'd have said that. But the reality is, it's the truth. It, it ain't the good news. See, the good news is, is that we don't have to preach a gospel that, that God is so far away from us that we can't get to him. Where is God? He's right here. Where is he? He's right here. He ain't across the street. He ain't over in China where I can't access him. But where is God? He's right here with my raggedy, crazy self, with my messed up thought processes, with my crazy perceptions, with my unforgiveness that might be still in my heart. Where is he? He's still right here. The Bible says that his mercies are new every morning so the reality is is that every morning that I get up I have another opportunity uh, to get myself together I have another chance to turn the corner and get this thing right I ain't got every I yesterday and I, I feel like preaching here and I didn't cross every T yesterday but I got another chance uh, because his mercies are new every morning and when he woke me up this morning I got another revelation that I got another chance to get this together. Don't push me tonight. I'm close to the edge, Zacho. So he says this. He says, by grace. Now, the one thing you got to understand about grace is that you didn't do anything to obtain it. Uh, it, it wasn't because you were so good. It wasn't because you were so kind. Uh, it, it wasn't because uh, you, you did everything so well. But it was because he made a decision uh, that his love for you 
was greater than anything that we could do to him and to give us an opportunity to receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost. And so understand this, grace, the reason why we're saved by grace is because salvation is free. It, it didn't cost you anything. But when Jesus hung on the cross, y'all got, got to hear me tonight. When he hung on the cross, he, he absorbed all of our sin. The Bible said that he took him who knew no sin and made him become sin. So the reality was, was that he absorbed all of our sins when he hung on that cross. He said, I could call 12 legion of angels right now to shut this mess down. But because of grace and his love for us, he said, I'm going to stay right here. Y'all ain't talking to me tonight. I'm going to stay right here because there's a Sharon. There's a, there's a Mel. There's a John. There's a Brittany that's got to have an opportunity to the tree of life. So if I don't stay here, they won't get a chance. So I'm going to stay right here. Yes, sir. We have grown up in church where they taught us that salvation uh, was work workspace. You got to live right. Now, please do not misunderstand me tonight. I ain't saying that there, that there is not a standard of holy living in Christianity. But what I am saying is this is that the reason why you say and the reason why you have access or you are righteous, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. The reason why I'm saved is because I'm saved by grace through what? Through faith. Now understand this. He said in Romans 10 and 17, he said faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Up two verses in the 15th verse, he says, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they are sin? So what happens is, is that my faith uh, latches on to not anything that I did, but what he did. So when I hear the message of the gospel, my faith is stirred. And then I confess uh, Christianity from that place of stirred faith. But it ain't got nothing to do with what I did. What he does is when I confess Christianity, he wipes the slate clean from yesterday and throws my transgressions in the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more and gives me a brand new mercy and opportunity to walk with him and get insight that I never had access to before. That ain't got nothing to do with what I did. That's got everything to do with what he did. Around <laughs> here talking about holy living and the reality is is we all a mess the bible says i wish i had a tampon right now a used one because i'll show you what the scriptures say when it says our righteousness is as filthy rags in his eyesight i wish i had one i'll show you what it looked like it's because what what we are calling our righteousness the bible says that, that, that they have submitted themselves to their own righteousness, but deny the righteousness of God. So the reality is, is what we've been taught is, is other folks righteousness who had no revelation of what the righteousness of God was. It's amazing to me how folk will sit up in church with children and they used to be some of the biggest hoes you ever seen, but want to act like your kids shouldn't do anything. Baby, they came out of you. It's some stuff. Apples come from apple trees, yes, baby. Sir, yes, it's sir. some stuff that's just going to happen because they belong to you. So we stand up in church talking about you need to be abstinent. Well, how are you going to tell your kids you need to be abstinent and you was a hoe? What you should do is, is you should tell your kids, I was a hoe, and this is why I was a hoe. I've been turned out before. I know what it's like to be in love with somebody that don't love you back. That's what you should tell your babies. But quit acting like you ain't never been nowhere, and you ain't never done nothing, as if your kids ain't gonna never do nothing. The devil is a liar.
Grandmama. I remember one night I was going out. The a preacher of the gospel. But I was going out. Wasn't going to do nothing wrong. We just were hanging out with his kids. I was 17 years old. My grandmama said, Y'all going out. At the time we used to be coming in. I said, Grandma, you ain't been out in 60 years. I don't know why you acting like brand new, like you don't know what's going on. We got to stop uh, treating our babies like we ain't never been their age before. Gabriel, he going he gonna to do some stuff. Isaac going to do some stuff. And I'll be right there as a loving father. Uh, to do everything I can do to help them. If they get somebody pregnant, I'll love the grandbaby just the same as if, whether they married or not married. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord and it is God who opens the womb when it's time for conception. So we need to stop talking about you had a baby out of wedlock and that ain't God. Well, who do you think opened the womb up? Hell. At the end of the day, if some young ladies, if they hadn't have got pregnant when they did, that baby ended up saving their life. So you better leave that alone and come up out of there because you don't know what God is doing. Lord, I'm in trouble tonight, but let me... I'm out here now. I might as well stay. And so, I remember Pastor John was preaching one time. See, this is why we got to discern God. He said a young lady walked up to him with a cast on her foot. And she said, I need you to pray, man of God, that this cat, that my foot heal and this cast get off my foot. He said, he looked at her and told her, he said, oh, I'm not going to pray. He said, because God, it, it, he's using this cast to slow your behind down. Uh, you'd be in all kind of stuff if it wasn't for this cast. So we're going to leave that cast right there until you get the revelation of what God is trying to do. Some stuff we calling sin and we calling unrighteousness and God is saying that's grace that's covering that thing and, and out of that I'm going to work my word. The Bible says that all things work together for the good of him that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So don't be looking at me crazy because I did something that you don't think I should have done. It's all working together, baby. Who you slept with is working together. Uh, uh, who you laid down, who you was shacking with is working together. Who, who taught you and who didn't teach you? Your daddy was there. He wasn't there. It's all working together. So we got God in this box. And God is saying, I'm working. I'm pulling the strings on this puppet. Just leave me alone and let me be. And so my boys, let me tell you something, Gabriel is just like me. So I know he's all hopeless romantic. Everything, everything is, is, is peaches and cream. And he gonna marry a woman that's an earth mover. I'm already prepared for it. Because otherwise ain't nothing gonna get done. They'll be gazing at the sky all day, hugging and kissing. Rent, rent getting evicted, lights getting cut off. So somebody got to somebody got to bring balance to the thing. He gonna he gonna be in love. He gonna get his little heart broke, and I'm gonna have to just say, son, I've been there, I know. But I'm not gonna treat him and act like I don't know what he's feeling. See, the reason why God can identify. Oh God, I'm Lord, I'm getting in trouble tonight. The reason why God can identify even with the stuff that we don't want to talk to him about is because he's been wrapped in flesh before. The, the stuff that you're trying to, he, he know what it is. The Bible says, oh God, the Bible says that Jesus was a man that was acquainted with grief because he knew what was in people. So he knew what it was like to love somebody that might not love him back. He, he knew what it was like to give his heart to somebody who don't know how to protect Yo, he knew what it was like to reach for somebody who don't know how to reach back. Jesus was a man that was acquainted with grief. The Bible says that he learned obedience through the things 
that he suffered. Yes, so the reality is, is there's a whole lot of things that Jesus experienced in his 33 years of life to, to try to help folk who didn't want to help themselves. Y'all ain't going to talk tonight. I'm talking about to be in relationship with people who were stabbing him in the back and he had to understand that it was for the greater good. I'm still talking about grace tonight. And so we've got to grow and mature in the stature of the things of God. I'm almost done here. But he said, let me put my glasses on, I can't see. He said, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So nobody in this room can take credit for being saved. You, you didn't do anything to obtain this is what he's saying. Watch this. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it ain't like gang initiation. You didn't have to take punishment to be considered part of the family. But you just simply had to confess with your mouth and believe with your heart the Lord Jesus that he was raised from the dead. And the Bible says that thou shalt be saved. And when we were adopted, we cried out, Abba, which means father, and we became heirs and joint heirs with him. Didn't have anything to do with works. It had everything to do with our confession. So this is why the Bible says that life and death lies in the power of the tongue and they that love it eat the fruit thereof so the reality is is that your confession is what brought you to the place of salvation now let's talk about living right because i know everybody went oh i got you got but what about living right you got to live right well let me explain something to you baby the folks that was talking to us about living right they didn't have the holy ghost so if there is no way that we can live right outside of the holy ghost see they talked to us about not drinking not smoking not cussing don't have premarital sex don't have sex with nobody else when you get married and that was the extent of holy living didn't talk to you about clean hands and a pure heart. Didn't talk to you about unforgiveness and bitterness. Didn't talk to you about none of that. The reality is, is that none of us can live right without the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that tells you don't go that way. It's the Holy Ghost that says a soft answer turns away wrath. It's the Holy Ghost that will talk to you and say, uh, don't say it like that. Say it like that. It's the Holy Ghost. So if you want to talk about living right, you can't talk about living right outside of the Holy Ghost. So what we're trying to do uh, without the Holy Ghost, please understand, I'm going to miss the mark every time. Because there's nothing good on the inside of me other than he that dwelleth on the inside of me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so the reality is, is that what the righteous, the little bit of righteousness that you see is because of the Holy Ghost. Because I really in my flesh wanted to cuss you out. I really in my flesh wanted to say something that I shouldn't say. I really, really, really wanted to pull out my nine and help you. But it was the Holy Ghost on the inside of me that constrains me. It's the Holy Ghost. That's the reason why I don't say everything that comes to my mind. It's the Holy Ghost. See, we have reduced the Holy Ghost to That's a gift. But the true nature of the Holy Ghost is to bring about change. So how I would respond in a certain situation, I don't respond that way anymore because the Holy Ghost on the inside of me, my, the, my old church mother, she used to say, I feel God stretching out in me. I cleaned out my house and I kicked the devil out because I feel it's because the Holy Ghost has expanded on the inside of me that what you see right is all because of the Holy Ghost. I'm almost done. I'm getting out of here. But he says this, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Now watch this. 
and I'm leaving you now, but he says this. He says, for we are his workmanship. That word workmanship, if you look it up in the Greek, it's talking about fabric. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So what happens is, is when I accept salvation or when I confess salvation and, and I begin to walk with him, he's already got grace set up. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. He's already got grace there for my mishap because he's working with me at the same time that I'm walking out this thing called Christianity. That's the reason why Paul said this. He says, I have not apprehended. He said, but I press toward the mark for the prize of the higher calling for Christ Jesus. Because what he's saying is, is that I'm not there right now. I understand now why they used to say in church, I ain't what I need to be, but I ain't what I used to be. Because it is, it is God that's working on me. The Bible says that we are his workmanship. And so it is him who works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And so the Bible also says that we are workers together with the Lord. So what happens is as God begins to talk to me about the areas that he's trying to do in me, I begin to make corrections based on what he's saying. So as he's talking, I'm moving according to what he's saying. That's the reason why he said, thy word, God, help me tonight, is a lamp unto my feet and a light along the pathway. And that's the reason why he said he would make my feet like hinds feet. And I would tread upon my high places because as I'm growing with him and as I'm walking with him, he's ordering my steps. And he's not going to let me fall. Even if I do fall, there's enough grace to cover me that I don't have to stay there because the Bible says a just man falls seven times but all seven times he gets back up again. Somebody say I'm his workmanship. Y'all ain't saying it right. Somebody say I'm his workmanship. He's still working on me. He's still, he's still, he's still paddling with my will. He's still working with my hard places. He's still working with the fact that my daddy didn't raise me and I'm still struggling with that. He's still working with the fact that I don't feel the love for my husband or I don't feel the love for my wife that I want to feel. He's still working with that. He's still working with how I feel about getting a divorce. He's still working on that. He's still working on how I feel about who I married and why I married him. He's still working on that. He's still working on who I've been with and why I've been with him. He's still working on me. And so I'm glad that there's enough grace that I don't have to have it right today. I, I, I ain't got to have it right today. The Bible says that we know not the day or the hour when the Son of Man shall appear. But before he comes back, he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. I'm so glad that I got, I got an opportunity to still get to a place called holiness. I, I, I'm glad... That even though I don't know, the Bible says that before he comes back, the gospel has got to be preached in the four corners of the earth. So I still got time. Now, now, God help me tonight. I'm trying not to. But in church, they would say you still you got to you can't act like you still got time. You got to get it right today. But on my bestest day. I'm still in trouble. And so the reality is, is that I'm glad is that with every day that I wake up, it's a good day to have a new mercy. Stand to your feet all over the room. I'm done. I don't, I don't I might not have been done. I'm just gonna quit. I'm not giving anybody a license to do anything. What I am saying is this, is at the end of the day, I don't have no heaven or hell to put you in. 
and, and, and I'm telling you, we, we've got this thing twisted up because it's going to be some folk that's going to be in heaven that we didn't think we was going to see them there. And it's going to be some folk that ain't going to be there who we just knew was on their way. What God is challenging tonight is do we really understand and know him? I'm telling you, Sunday, this man of God, he talked so cold up in here and he challenged what we thought, what I thought I knew about God. See, the Bible says it's Hebrews 6. He talks about the doctrines of the faith, six doctrines of the faith. And he says, we well, said we're moving on from the principles of the doctrines of Jesus Christ, not laying again the foundation for repentance of dead works. He lists them. And then he says, this we will do if God permits. The problem is, is we trying to leave the elementary principles and God has not permitted it because we don't have a thorough enough understanding of foundation. We still fight with whether or not we good with God because we crazy as hell. Let me just help you. At the end of the day, we all crazy as hell and we gonna always need more grace. So I don't question my relationship with him because I might not have got it right today. I don't question it because I know that if I do miss it, that we have a, a, a mediator between God and man and his name is Jesus who has already gone on my behalf. So tonight, I'm telling you, we're not going to pray long. I'm going to give this mic to Pastor John. But tonight, I want you to just lift your hands real quick. And what God came to do tonight and on Sunday, started on Sunday, I mean, it's been started a long time ago, but Sunday was part and this was another piece. He came to free us from our thought processes and perceptions about what we think and what we don't think. And so tonight, <laughs> this is a real simple instruction. God is simply opening up a door in front of you and giving you a place to walk through it. You don't ever have to think the same way or see it the same way anymore. Now, there are some things about what God has taught us that's never going to change. But there are some things that God is, bring, is evolving in us because what we thought we knew about him, we really didn't receive it correctly. So listen, tonight, Father, in Jesus' name, we cover these babies tonight. God, every single stronghold that you came to pull down tonight, God, I give you praise that you have given us a fresh revelation, a fresh insight, a newness into how you see us, that your thoughts toward, toward us are good and they are holy thoughts. And God, we give you praise tonight for the change in our mind. We give you praise tonight for the newness of our spirit. We give you praise tonight, God, that you're breaking every chain and destroying every yoke tonight. In the name of Jesus, God, I give you praise that you're bringing healing to our perception. You're bringing healing to our thought process. You're bringing healing to our minds are being renewed right now in the name of Jesus. And God, as we leave this place and we ascend to another place in you, God, we thank you that we will never be the same. We declare and decree over our lives that we will never be the same, God. And we thank you for it. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. If you believe it, come on and clap your hands. Thank God for him. Come on, thank God for him. 